would like to ask um, our first panelist and the moderator of the first panel to come to the table, to come um, forward. Um, the moderator of the panel will be Oniko Felix, CEO of Hover Foundation, and the participants of the panel discussion will be Daniel Bogomiri, head of office, head of the Budapest office of the International Organization for Migration, Remy Boni, Ex executive director of Forbidden Colors, Vivian Brasho, illegal director of European Roma Rights Center, and Jessica Levin, senior research analyst at the World Jewish Congress. Okay. Hello, uh, hello everyone, uh, dear guests and dear audience. Uh, it is my honor to welcome you. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. To the first uh, panel discussions of today's conference. Uh, the panel discussion will be about hate speech in the European societies. And thank you, Buchu, for, introduction, uh, for the introduction. Uh, and uh, we have a very great and diverse uh, group of experts here. And uh, we will try to go deeper with the topics that have been raised in the excellent uh, keynote. Uh, and um, uh, we, will, we will start uh, with with the first topic is the, the Europe, European societies. Um, so uh, the title is hate speech in the European societies. And um, we discussed already, as uh, Anna Rossi said in the beginning, that hate does not stop at the borders. And also Tamás Beretz uh, mentioned it, that uh, it's uh, all across the continent and also uh, uh, out of the continent, but I'm curious to hear your opinion about uh, if we does does uh, make any sense to talk about it at the European level. In what uh, sense, and uh, there are any distinctive characteristics that true exclusive to Europe, and uh, how do you see from the point of view of the vulnerable groups that your organization represents? And uh, I think anyone can start answering. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you for Political Capital and all the partners also for inviting me. So uh, my name is Remy Boni. Uh, I am <coughs> working for an organization called Forbidden Colors. Uh, we work specifically on LGBTQ plus groups inside the European Union with specific interest and in also monitoring their interlinkage to democratic resilience, a world of monitoring of anti-LGBTQ plus groups in the European Union. Um, so to answer your question, uh, um, yes, um, obviously there is a very European uh, dimension all of this, given the fact that we've been monitoring over the last years that hate speech on social media or in, in public sphere in general is something that has been spread not only by individuals anymore, but by groups by state actors and uh, we've been seeing over last years uh, also here in Hungary uh, but it originally came from countries obviously like Russia although obviously it didn't actually originate from there um, uh, huge international conferences where uh, anti LGBTQ plus narratives have been have been made not only to to increase hate towards our communities, but also to steer up and polarize uh, our European societies. So yes, there is a very European dimension of fact that our adversaries and all of this have uh, have been instigating hate towards our community, but also many of the communities that will come after, uh, after me here, uh, just specifically in a way to polarize our democratic societies. And I think the country that we are in here today is a very good example uh, of, 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 uh, of this. Um, maybe before jumping into, uh, I shouldn't speak too long, I guess. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so maybe before jumping into more of the networking analysis of all of this, I wanted to give you a few numbers of uh, that are that have been recently launched by the by the European Union, by the Eurobarometer, and also a bit longer ago by the Fundamental Rights Agency about how LGBTQ plus people perceive themselves uh, in our European societies and how also in general European societies perceive discriminations towards our communities. So last December. December, actually, the 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 the, 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 the commission, um, there's there's uh, the statistics unit uh, released a new Eurobarometer on discrimination, which uh, shows that 57 persons 
uh, of EU citizens say that discrimination is widespread for being transgender or intersex, and 54 persons um, uh, say that it's uh, uh, that this is the same for based uh, at uh, sexual orientation of being lesbian, gay, or uh, or otherwise bisexual. Um, if we looked in specifically, because I know the audience is mainly Hungarian here, um, that we actually see that that Hungarian people actually perceive this as less discrimination. 57 per, uh, 47%, uh, which is 10% lower if it comes to uh, comes to transgender people, which is kind of, I think, a very interesting analysis uh, where, I mean, your government has been saying for many, many years that these anti-discrimination methods are not necessary, that, uh, that actually the government itself is implementing discriminatory methods towards the community. It obviously led, leads now to an increase in, yeah, well, a decrease in the perception of discrimination, at least, uh, of LGBTQ plus people. Um, maybe then jumping into the perceptions of LGBTQ plus people themselves. Uh, that's research is a bit longer ago. It's before the COVID-19 crisis, we, so it's a little bit difficult maybe to, to, to use this as like a valid thing for today, but we can only assume that it's even got worse because of COVID-19. Um, and 2020, the Fundamental Rights Agency of the EU uh, in a big LGBTQ plus survey uh, amongst members of our community said that one out of ten experienced physical or sexual assault towards, so, towards themselves over the last 12 months. 38 percent experienced some form of harassment for just being LGBTQ+. Um, and 33 percent actually say that they often or always avoid certain places for just being afraid of being assaulted, threatened or harassed. Interesting again here, Hungary is 40 percent. So you see there is a difference in the perception of the white public in Hungary and the perception of the community itself, uh, very much. Um, again, I've been referring often to Hungary, not just only for, 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 the, for the mere fact that we are in Hungary and many of you are Hungarian, also because obviously we have seen that the Hungarian government have been state sponsoring and hate towards LGBTQ plus people. What I've been monitoring over the last years is that when 10 years ago almost 15 years ago now, the, the Russian government was the main sponsor and instigator for LGBTQ plus, uh, anti-LGBTQ plus international groupings, so organizing conferences, even conferences all around Europe, including in Budapest. Today, this is different. Russia is still there. Russia is still spreading this information through troll farms, uh, troll, uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of networks that they have. But to be fairly honest, if I look, if I look and even participate and filtrate sometimes in anti-LGBTQ conference on the in, on the international level, I see much more Hungarians than I see Russians. So it's fair to be fairly honest. The Hungarian government has taken over the leadership role if it comes to anti-LGBTQ plus hate uh, on an on an international level. Um, I think we can go deeper probably later on this, but I don't want to speak for too long. So uh, so so yes, thank you. Others can continue. Yeah, it's on. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Vivi Brashoy, and I work for the European Roma Rights Center, which is um, an international uh, public interest law organization combating anti Romani racism um, across Europe. Currently, we are working in um, around 16 countries, involved in 150 uh, pieces of litigation, mainly um, before the European Court of Human Rights, and we cover a wide range of topics such as police violence, uh, school segregation, obviously hate speech and hate crimes, um, access to adequate housing. Um, and as our name also uh, mentions, we are a European uh, international organization, so our focus is on Europe. And um, definitely there is, um, there is um, specificities related to hate speech and hate crimes uh, concerning Romani communities in Europe. Um, um, actually, Ro Roma are the biggest minority of, of uh, Europe, uh, up to, I mean, um, estimated numbers are up to 12 million, uh, uh, according to the Co uh, Council of Europe, but this is just estimation, actually, ten, 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 from 10, I think, up to 12 million, um, and uh, we are the mo actually the most, most marginalized um, minority in Europe. and. Um, um, 
related to to trends i i would say that <coughs> sorry wha what we see uh, monitoring hate, spe hate speech in in european countries is that there are common stereotypes against Romani people in most of the European countries. Uh, these are very generic ones, but there are also some spe specific ones. For example, and I would come back again to also to Hungary. And I, I by the way, I'm I'm a Hungarian Roma, so uh, I, I'm most familiar with the situation in Hungary. But um, for for example, in Hungary, um, the far right would try to influence the, the general discourse on Romani people on social media, especially um, specifically focusing on Romani, Romani people being violent or dangerous. And what we see that this narrative, for example, would, wouldn't be on, on the agenda of the far right of, of, of Serbia or Albania. So we, we see that there are these different trends and what I would also as a trend would emphasize, uh, Tom Ansh mentioned it, that uh, basically as, as we see um, far right and populist uh, politicians uh, inciting hatred against Romani people and vulnerable communities, we see the rise, the uh, rise of hate crimes against against Romani people. And if, if, if I just uh, would need to mention ve very few examples from the recent years, um, 2019 um, in France, a very, very ancient um, stereotype about Romani people being kidnappers, child kidnappers, uh, went viral on social media. And because of, of that rumor of these people being um, uh, being child kidnappers and ab abducting children, um, people went to the streets and basically attacked makeshift homes of Romani people in, in certain areas because it got so strong and people started to really go got angry that Romani people in white vans and then there was another rumor in black vans kidnapping children and this is really comes from from stereotypes from the Middle Ages and and then in Italy um, Romani families being placed in um, in emergency shelters the the far right um, neo nazi movement uh, casa pound actually bo brought people outside uh, of of this shelter and just because Romani people were placed there uh, attacked the the shelter put fire um, put uh, vehicles and cars on fire um, didn't allow the firefighters to get in and destroy the food that was brought to pe uh, Romani people trapped in the shelter. And then the last example that I would bring related to how hate speech actually directly relate to ha hate crimes uh, uh, is the Ukrainian pogroms between 2016 and 2018, which actually was the offline violence that happened at that time in Ukraine was heavily influenced and followed and actually uh, streamlined on social media and and uh, actually uh, it was kind of um, a performative act and streamlining um, these violent attacks on social media uh, was almost as important part of of this hate campaigns against Romani people as the physical acts so yes I, I, I would say that, that definitely that there are um, extra dimensions and and hung, uh, or uh, European dimensions to it um, and I just would close here and give the floor to thank you so much Jessica hello my name is Jessica Levine and I work for the World Jewish Congress the World Jewish Congress is an organization that represents over a hundred national Jewish communities and functions and represents as an umbrella organization. And it was created in Geneva in 1936 when Europe was going through some hard times and especially for minorities all throughout Europe. And it was created because uh, the Jewish minority of Europe did not have a state or anyone to represent them. So the thought uh, behind the World Jewish Congress is to be a voice for the the global world Jewry to represent them. 
Yeah. And so when it comes to trends in Europe, I want to fall back a little bit on what our keynote speaker said, because I believe that uh, anti-Semitism is <coughs> definitely not a new phenomenon, but it has very much been interconnected with recent changes in the world and different shifts. If you look at world events such as refugees increasing and the Russian invasion of Ukraine, COVID, and especially now recently October 7th that happened in Israel. And when it comes to the refugee crisis, I would say that uh, Jewish conspiracies or conspiracy theories about Jews were very present. You could see the great replacement theory about how Jews are trying to replace uh, the white people of Europe was popping up. The same thing when it came to COVID, I would say it was became quite clear that uh, on the one hand, Jews were believed of creating the virus, also being immune to the virus, but somehow also spreading it. Um, and one thing I've learned when it comes to hate speech and hate crime is to never try and find any logic in any of it, because there isn't any. And also when it has come to uh, the war in Ukraine, you see a narrative being spread about, you know, denazifying it. Um, and, uh, and also kind of the thought that the Jews were the worst Nazis, that the Jews weren't innocent in what happened during the Second World War. And all of these stereotypes that are now being portrayed are very, very harmful and difficult for the Jewish population of Europe. And only since October 7th, we've seen in Europe an increase, depending on country, between 300 to 900 percent of anti-Semitic incidents. Incidents ranging from uh, hate speech, um, up to physical violence and destruction of property and things like that. But what I think is the most scary part that is happening right now is sort of the dehumanization of the Jews of Europe. The discourse that is being spread is kind of making the Jew not to be a human anymore, not to have the same values. Um, so this is something I think we need to keep in mind on how to combat while moving forward this year. But on another, like more positive note, I would say that one trend that I do see in Europe compared to many other places in the world is the will for the European society and countries to actively engage in improving policy and combating hate speech and hate crimes and implement new and effective measures. And they seem to be very open to listen on a national level and also on the EU level. Thank you. Yes. Daniel. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much first for uh, uh, Madam Deputy Commissioner for inviting me to sit on this uh, uh, very prestigious uh, panel. Uh, first of all, uh, I feel also a little bit the odd one out because I'm not a hate speech uh, expert and our organization, uh, IOM, which is the UN Migration Agency, is not a hate speech uh, expert either. Uh, but as said in the opening uh, remarks, we are an organization that works on the social context uh, around uh, hate speech. And in particular, we do work with uh, vulnerable uh, migrant uh, groups. And you all mentioned, so when it comes to migration and hate speech and the link there and the role of our organization, maybe they don't need uh, further uh, justification. Uh, let me just go back to the original question, whether hate speech uh, exists in Europe and whether there are any distinct uh, features there. Um, well, I think you all said that yes, of course, it uh, does exist and it's on the increase, uh, unfortunately. So we see the same for uh, anti-migrant, anti-refugee sentiments. And uh, I think in Europe in particular, I don't want to go into a historical analysis, but definitely how nationalism and nationalistic uh, movements uh, develop. They have a lot to do with the link between nationalistic uh, rhetoric to anti-migrant, anti-refugee uh, uh, sentiments and how they have been developed and how they are uh, being exploited for uh, political purposes. And I also do agree with the excellent uh, keynote speech uh, in terms of the division between Western Europe and uh, Eastern Europe, uh, especially when it comes to hate speech uh, against uh, migrants and refugee communities, where we see that in Western Europe, mostly the public discourse is based on multiculturalism, past experience of that, 
perceived fail attempts to do uh, proper social inclusion programming and how they, uh, the migrants uh, can contribute to the society and such. While here uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, discussions more and more about, as Deputy uh, uh, Commissioner highlighted as well, fear mongering and uh, trying to capitalize on, on something that might come uh, our way and might uh, influence uh, our societies. And also in this sense, what is a distinct, unique uh, feature of the, of, uh, the EU uh, and the European societies as well is from anti-migrant perspective is that we all know that these societies are aging and we all know that there is a clear need and demand for migrant workers, for uh, labor force uh, coming in outside of the EU. Uh, and we also see, and I guess we will touch upon uh, how that is uh, being uh, uh, politically explained uh, as well in, in Hungary, how we uh, have uh, a government fueled uh, anti migration and anti migrant uh, narrative, while uh, there are very clear incentives for bringing in migrants, they are also migrants, for the purposes of employment and uh, uh, construction, but also long term uh, uh, investments as well. And uh, um, and I also just want to highlight, because uh, I already heard this uh, morning uh, two times, that there is no logic in a uh, hate speech. Uh, fully agree, if we look at the internal dimensions. But I want to highlight, because us as IOM, we are really active in that uh, field, that uh, we need to look at the root uh, causes. And we need to work on uh, related social in inequalities, uh, uh, misinformation, or also digital literacy. We just heard also in the opening speech how uh, uh, the online space is, is gaining more uh, importance in this sense. And final sentence, uh, because we see that uh, obviously uh, hate speech uh, is closely affiliated with uh, hate crime discrimination. No uh, uh, debate there, but uh, we see among our vulnerable beneficiaries, how this actually leads to uh, fear and uh, anxiety uh, among uh, these vulnerable groups and how that results in their reluctance to uh, ask for help, to access uh, services and how in our uh, groups, uh, how that results in their uh, wish to return to their home countries instead of uh, trying to seek justice uh, in Hungary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, all of you had mentioned many, many important things, and uh, I think it's not a question anymore that there are some distinct, distinct, with, distinct with characteristics of uh, hate speech that uh, are exclusive to Europe or uh, more important in Europe. So uh, I would go up a little bit to a European Union level. Also, you mentioned it uh, many times uh, that uh, there are good or uh, even better um, uh, measures uh, regarding hate speech speech uh, at the European level, but I'm, I would like to ask you uh, that what do you see, uh, how do you see it, uh, how effective these measures are, what would you recommend to the European Union to, to make it more effective against uh, hate speech uh, to your, uh, regarding your, the vulnerable groups that you are working with in your organization? Yeah, I'm happy to start. So, um, no, yeah. Um, so, basically, obviously, uh, from the LGBTQ plus perspective, uh, the European Commission has adopted in 2021 its first uh, ever LGBTQ plus uh, equality strategy. It's basically a strategy uh, on how to achieve more equality for our community. And then there, there are a few measures uh, that are very, very important for our communities, but also for communities that are around the table here. And actually, one of these measures that was mentioned. And the strategies um, got to quite an important stage last week during the European Parliament's plenary in Strasbourg. Uh, the European Parliament voted a report to give consent to the European Council to extend the EU crimes lists uh, and to include hate speech and hate crime in there. Um, obviously, as LGBTIQ plus communities, we are extremely happy with this. Uh, this is, uh, we see a lack of hate crime and hate speech legislation everywhere in the European Union. So this is extremely important for our communities. However, uh, it's also important to mention that this is still a long procedure. There's still a long procedure ahead and that it doesn't look very, how to put it diplomatically, looking good. Um, <laughs> sorry if I'm not, that was not a diplomatic uh, um, way of putting it. Um, 
and uh, to, to get the the necessary unanimity in uh, in, in the council uh, so for uh, to extend the eu crimes list which is part of the treaty on the functioning of the european union this would mean that we need to do a treaty change and for doing a treaty change you need unanimity in the european council and as we know for now at least three member states are blocking it so again i guess you can guess at least one of them um and which is quite of interest kind of interesting because there's already quite a good hate crime hate speech law in hungary uh, and still they're blocking it on the european level so i think that's also tel telling a little bit about the political dimensions towards all of this um, but i think also given that there are three countries today blocking it and the wider political um, developments that we see in Europe, there's also a chance for finally getting through with it. And there I'm specifically looking to my colleague from uh, from the World Jewish uh, Congress, is that there must be much more pushing from, I think, from, from especially Jewish communities now uh, with the rise of anti-Semitism and the, and the unanimity somehow amongst countries that there needs to be, uh, that, the, that, that we need to tackle anti-Semitism. Um, at least there is a possibility now to extend uh, uh, extends the first stage and, and and the extension of the EU crimes list because it's a very it's a bit technical but I think I have to explain it to for you to uh, to fully understand the way of, of, of adding grounds of hate crime and, uh, and and hate speech to the EU treaty means that first the treaty needs to change and just it needs to be added that EU crimes also include hate crime and hate speech there are no grounds being mentioned in that to have the grounds being mentioned there is a second stage after the adoption of the, of, of the treaty change uh, where there is a legal framework that needs to be adopted which is specifically mentioning grounds such as sexual orientation, uh, gender identity, gen, uh, uh, sex characteristics, uh, religion and so on. Um, and for that you don't need unanimity. There you need just qualified majority. So there is a possibility, uh, especially given this two-stage step, um, steps that, that we need to to, ad to adopt uh, hate, cr hate speech and hate crimes in the EU treaties um, to actually achieve it now, given the political circumstances that we have today. So, um, so that's the first division, obviously, and I think that's uh, th one of the most important things that's happening at the moment at the European Union level, and we all need to push as much as, as possible for it, uh, be it very wise. Um, obviously, next to that, what I would like to see the European Union to do more is also to focus a little bit more on their external actions and on what, and, and what they are doing, because, I mean, Russia has been... Um, fallen here a few days, uh, a few times today already, um, and uh, we obviously, I mean, we've been working very closely over the last months with European External Action Service on the reports, uh, specifically on what they call foreign information manipulation interference, FIMI. Uh, it's a new term that they have invented uh, to basically monitor how, for instance, Russia is spreading uh, content is hateful uh, to polarize European societies. And uh, we've been seeing, and especially on LGBTQ+, there is, uh, before the European elections now, there's a huge rise uh, coming from there. And uh, again, uh, there are a few ways of tackling this. I mean, obviously, to by, by looking at the social media platforms, but also by making it impossible, for instance, for Russian oligarchs to come to Europe and to, to open bank accounts uh, to do business here. And I think still today we see that some of the Russian oligarchs that we've been monitoring and exposing for over the last 15 years already for sponsoring anti-LGBTQ groups in Europe are still not on EU sanctions lists. Um, again, mainly because one country is blocking it, um, but that one country has also adopted EU sanctions in the past. So it's also oh <laughs> so it, so it's also very very important to state that it's also up to the other EU countries to push Hungary as much as possible. Uh, to also um, get certain oligarchs that are responsible for spreading hate in the European Union um, the, to, to get them on EU sanctions list at the moment. Um, and I think that's still possible somehow. If you want to comment, yes. Um, so 
European Union efforts and how uh, effective yes, they yes, are. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I would say, uh, first of all, what you just mentioned now uh, that was happening last week and is continuing is very, very important because uh, there is some part of uh, there is hate speech and hate crimes mentioned in the EU law from 2008, but it really needs to be more incapacitative and really what they're calling for now is not to be able to hide behind the shield of free speech. Um, and secondly, I do believe that EU has quite a few initiatives that are effective. I would say that uh, the Commission and the High Representative in December of 23 now adop uh, adopted a joint communication that's called No Place for Hate, a Europe uh, United Against Hatred. And within this, they are upgrading the code of conduct agreed upon with major online platforms. They have increased funding in the International Security Fund that I think many organizations here today can also apply from. And an upgraded role, which I find very interesting, for the envoys uh, and coordinators for combating anti-Semitism and fostering Jewish life. Um, and also adding that it didn't exist before combating anti-Muslim hatred and racism. So I think with this and the EU giving the so-called envoys and uh, coordinators, I call them SECA, uh, we can really have them push on a national level to get uh, more to represent our communities, but also to make sure that they are placed well within a national government. And the high level hate crime, uh, the high level group for hate crime and hate speech also within the EU also kind of disseminate uh, good practices by having discussions and exchange with different IOs and uh, social, civil society on a grassroots level. I would say one thing that is a hindrance for the EU, I guess, is the kind of slow processes sometimes. Uh, modern expressions of hate speech and hate crime is constantly changing and evolving. And I think the EU needs to do better on implementation and changing quicker. Yeah. So um, this is not really related to hate speech and hate crime. It's just the general impression of our organization that the EU has, has to do much better related to, to Roma rights. And even the, the Fundamental Rights Agency um, said that the Racial Equality Directive doesn't work for Roma properly. It doesn't cover, for example, forced evictions, covers school segregation in some extent, and, and other type of discrimination relevant for Romani people, but it's very difficult to access it. So far, there is only one uh, judgment was brought by the European Court of Justice related to Romani people and, and actually was brought by a non-Roma non woman and it was a um, 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 discrimination by association. So I think that also shows that how difficult to reach that level and how not effective are the EU mechanisms for Roma. And I just think in general, like um, the violation of rule of law and the, the democratic uh, backsliding in, in many European countries at the moment are just alarming. And, and um, I just, everything that my colleague said colleague said it's it's welcome but related to 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 roma rights and access to justice for roma in most of the european countries um the the eu just needs to do much better and, and actually um put stricter str sanctions for member states to really respect the 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 values of the eu that that it was funded because we we don't really see see this at the moment for Romani people in in Europe. So, do you want to add something? Uh, uh, yes, it is because I think also um, given the fact that there are already existing things happening on the European on the European Union level, we saw until not so long ago a European Commission was not always willing to act upon that, especially if it comes to political sensitive topics. Um, 
Um, and I mean, every time that the European Commission could have started an infringement procedure against a member state that is infringing upon the rights of minorities, we saw this just not happening because, because, uh, because of the political dimensions. However, I mean, what has changed recently, with uh, especially regarding Hungary, is with the anti-LGBTQ plus legislation, the so-called child protection law, which I prefer to call the Russian and the Russian-inspired uh, anti anti -propaganda. Law um, is, um, is 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 uh, is is quite groundbreaking. I, was, I must say uh, we were quite involved in in, in, in all of the advocacy around the infringement procedure, and if we look at the pleadings in there, um, uh, we see that, for instance, the first time ever there is a sole pleading against against the law based on Article Two of the Treaty of the European Union, which is the tre which is the article on um, on, uh, on 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 values on. European values and nor norms and values, which is about human rights and living and dignity in Europe and so on. For the first time, every European Commission is going to court against a member state based on based on this. So this is already groundbreaking. Um, and there we also see that it's for the first time ever, I would say, also a large group of member states who want also to stand up for minority rights in Europe. It's the first time ever uh, that 16 member states now we have we were able to convince to join the Commission in courts and courts and and Luxembourg against Hungary on this specific law. Um, and that's quite an important statement uh, because it's the largest group ever to go against a member state ever in any lawsuits in the, hist in the history of the European Union. So that's quite an important statement. So you feel that from progressive liberal point of view, progressive liberals are starting to get the point. Uh, however, I think that there still needs to be a large push because in the case of Hungary it's much more easy for member states to do so. But if we look to a few other member states who could also use kind of similar infringement procedures such as Romania, Bulgaria and so on, we don't see anything happening. So. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, well, the first thing that came to mind when you asked this question and, and put down immediately is to discourage hate speech, but also to um, create uh, positive narratives uh, around uh, migration in my case, but I think we can apply to other uh, vulnerable groups as well. So we need positive uh, stories of uh, inclusivity and, and mutual uh, respect. So. What I think, and I'm mostly talking about uh, how the EU funds are being utilized for such uh, purposes. So there, I think there are two streams of work uh, that should be taken more seriously. One is uh, protection for the most uh, vulnerable from discrimination and hate speech. I think the EU needs to increase efforts in this uh, regard. But at the same time, uh, promoting uh, inclusion and integration of vulnerable groups uh, into the uh, society, and in particular, focusing on uh, education. Most of these EU funds and programs, they need to go into schools, into the uh, curriculum, into the uh, teaching materials, and so on. There needs to be a bigger and more impactful uh, awareness raising and information campaigns uh, to uh, simply address all the information gaps and misinformation that is out there. And here, uh, coming from my frustration when we try to do such information campaigns, I want to uh, emphasize uh, the importance of coalition, something that uh, should be I think a very important mandatory part of these EU funds, especially on this topic. You cannot be effective without a coalition of uh, state entities, uh, civil society. In particular, I want to emphasize the role of grassroots who are in the community and can work with the community and understand their concerns. But at the same time, we work with uh, international organizations as well to make sure that uh, uh, international standards and similar standards across countries are being uh, applied. And uh, just said, but I want to highlight again, grassroots, grassroots, grassroots. They should be receiving uh, uh, more uh, funding from the rights, equality, citizenship type of uh, uh, programming. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, you mentioned coalitions. And uh, actually, this is the way we move forward. And uh, that uh, I would like to ask the others as well, that uh, what kind of coalitions you build with your organization uh, for the purposes that you want to achieve, uh, even with other organizations, civil society organizations, uh, grassroots movements, and uh, 
if it's possible, uh, nation states uh, as well. Uh, obviously, not every case, but uh, uh, what possible coalitions you imagine and what you are actually doing uh, as a good example of coalition building. Um, so, when it comes to coalition building, I think I want to start by taking one step back. Um, to effectively combat anti-Semitism, in my opinion and the WJC's opinion, it really starts with education. And so, by trying to implement uh, educational initiatives on many different levels, uh, both when it comes to uh, of course, schools, curricula, but also when it comes to civil servants, judicial authorities, and uh, law enforcement agencies. To train to understand the ever-changing expressions of hate speech um, is very important to even know what to look for and to be able to create change. And, uh, and this is something I think you really need to work and create coalitions. You need to work with nation states. You need to have a holistic approach to use interfaith, interculture initiatives and uh, try to find ways to engage as many actors as possible. Uh, for example, the WJC has a project called uh, Bridges that is funded by the EU Commission. And it is a holistic approach for training and prevention uh, for hate speech and hate crimes. And uh, we are, together with experts training Jewish communities around the world on online hate, uh, we are also involving the uh, special envoys for combating anti-Semitism and fostering Jewish life, as well as the major social media companies to try together to work to create more understanding and combating anti-Semitism. And it's, uh, and then another project that I th we just ended that has been very successful is called the NOAA project. And it has been uh, very EU involved looking at EU state policies and uh, education and culture and security, how to evolve. Uh, EU, state, EU policies and EU member states policies to further be able to combat hate speech. And this has definitely been with over a hundred different kind of network, grassroots organizations, uh, both Jewish and non-Jewish, uh, to together kind of overcome this hurdle um, and to make a change. And it's been very successful, uh, but it's come to an end now. So. Uh, in my opinion, it really has to start by understanding hate speech or hate crimes from many different directions and educating about it. Thank you. Um, so with the ERRC, actually we have a network of volunteers. We call them Roma Rights Defenders. And um, they... Um, they are um, Roma and non-Roma volunteers together um, actually helping the, the ERRC's work online um, and, and contribute the, the um, we have an initiative called uh, Challenging Digital Anti-Gypsism and they work together to, to monitor, uh, record and then report uh, online hate speech and um, this really um, started as a very small initiative, but so far now we we have a group in Albania, one in Serbia, uh, one in Ukraine. Uh, it's a quite big one, um, around 30 volunteers. We had a huge network in Turkey, but we needed to shut it down because authorities started to actually um, Let's say not appreciate their work um, related to Roma rights, but actually they they um, um, they they uh, created their own NGO now. They called Roma Negodi in Turkey, and and, and they have a massive. Um, 
work related to Roma rights violations um, in, in Turkey. And, and we have um, partner organizations um, in Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and also Romania with uh, volunteer sections who also actually wor work together with us. And, and I think this is, um, this is a quite good example how to build um, coalition and how actually a Romani young activist can take charge of their rights. Um, and how non-Roma young activists actually can be good allies and, and how their Romani peers to, 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 to report online hate speech. So th this, this would be... Yeah. I have a question about is that uh, how do you recruit the uh, non-Roma volunteers or what are the pool for, for this initiative? Yeah, so we started with an open call and, and really few people uh, applied, but as we started, I think um, we started this in 2019, beginning of 2020, before the, the pandemic. And then people just started to spread the word and actually convinced and asked their peers to, to join and, and basically really grew, um, I would say, organically. And, and um, they really enjoy working uh, together. For, fortunately, we we can provide them um, time by time space to, to meet with, with each other, share their experiences, and, and hopefully in April, on 8th of April, we will have a bigger conference where we would like to br br uh, um, bring together all, all of the volunteers who work together on, on this project so far. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let me maybe talk a little bit about an initiative we took um, a few months ago. We organized the first conference in Brussels. Uh, uh, we call it the United for Diversity Conference, um, where we went, wanted to bring together all kinds of actors, uh, which we define as frontline democracy defenders from the LGBTQ plus gender perspective. So what we've been trying to do is, uh, as a kind of our conclusion, many of the, of the EU member states or even across the world, is that LGBTQ plus activists have been become partly also frontline democracy defenders. We need to be perceiving them in that sense as well. And um, so what we did is to have a conference uh, on the creation of a new network that we are setting up at, at this very moment on f white actors, not just LGBTQ plus activists from all around the world, but also, for instance, human rights organizations working more on the rule of law, democratic resilience, um, some, st some state actors. The conference itself was sponsored by the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the Belgian Minister of Foreign Affairs participated in the conference and so on. Um, but also, for instance, people working in intelligence services. Uh, I mean, I've been talking before about the Russians being involved in spreading anti-LGBTQ hate to steer up um, to steer up polarization. As long as we don't fight with the right means, with the uh, with the means on this on, on this uh, at least on the same level, um, we will not never be able to 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 counter that. And we can try as much as we want a civil society, but there will be never enough money to do so. Russians are spreading and most invested most estimations are about three to five hundred million euros every year inside the European Union to spread anti LGBTQ hate. So given budgets like serve and so on, which is just a few million to spread amongst a lot of minority groups, not specifically on countering uh, this information, then I think we can quite easily con 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 conclude there that, that, that we are fighting against actors which are much stronger than us. So we need to also include st uh, actors that are much st stronger. And therefore, we are trying now to set up meetings with NATO ambassadors, with intelligence services, and so on. I myself am going next week to New York and DC to talk with American actors. Obviously, we know there is a very well-established transatlantic link on all of this as well. So we need to work also more on the trans and on from a transatlantic um, cooperation as well on this. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of the thing that we're trying to do to, to widen up our scope as well, because by just organizing Pride and, be, and, and, and being there as LGBTQ plus activists, this is not a fight that we can win anymore. We know that we have been put in, in the front line, uh, sorry to use this kind of warmongering uh, language, <laughs> 
but really put in front of the front line of defending democracy today in Europe. Um, and as long as wider actors in society don't perceive it that way, but our adversaries very much perceive it that way, we will never able to fully effectively fight back. Uh, so that's kind of the, the, the work that we are doing right now to create that network to make sure that these actors um, that are working on more democratic resilience and security, national security as well, also perceive the importance of fighting for our rights. So we, uh, you already mentioned the very great initiatives uh, regarding coalition building and also uh, initiatives to tackle hate speech that y your organizations are doing. But uh, I would like to have an even more uh, positive end of this uh, panel, if even if we are realistic. But uh, if you have any other, uh, you mentioned uh, positive narratives, uh, ideas that uh, you would uh, use or you already use uh, to tackle uh, hate speech uh, in, in your organization and uh, what you see as a, as a future of your uh, work uh, and uh, what are the most uh, important um, initiatives in, in this case, but you already not mentioned if there is anything that you want to add um, as a positive end of, of this conversation. Daniel. Other than what you just highlighted that I already uh, mentioned uh, and the very specific uh, Hungarian topic now, but something that is uh, spreading in uh, Eastern Europe is the situation with uh, what the, uh, the journalists and politicians call uh, guest workers. Uh, so there we already uh, see that uh, that's going to be another interesting uh, angle to, to work with. And there, uh, let me just uh, highlight uh, our work uh, around uh, community building and community engagement uh, type of activities. So in this uh, very specific uh, case, uh, and I think that's uh, applicable to other contexts as well, to prepare communities uh, for the arrival of uh, migrant workers for the uh, different uh, investments that are happening and try to address some of the questions and concerns they have. Because what we see is, again, a, a general conclusion of um, academic research as well, that once you get to know the, the other, uh, then you are less likely to uh, develop uh, uh, any sort of uh, discriminatory behavior or uh, attitude and so on. Uh, and this is very much the, the case with uh, the guest workers in the country as well, that we see that there are different uh, narratives around uh, fear and uh, social dumping related to uh, migrant workers coming into the uh, country. Uh, but at the same time, we also see that if we ask those uh, communities that have been living together with uh, the Filipino migrant workers in uh, Western Hungary for long years, for whom this is not a new uh, phenomenon, they all say, and this is not unique to the, the Filipino community, so there's not, nothing ethnic there, that uh, they are nice, cute, well-behaved uh, people who are here to do their job, and they are law-abiding uh, citizens, so all in all, the comment is nothing wrong with them. So uh, we need to, and we know the general political context in Hungary, so we need to get to this nothing wrong with them uh, stance uh, in the communities because we know that this is a rapidly increasing uh, phenomenon uh, in Hungary and something that is very crucial to the social fabric but also to the uh, economic development of this country. So community engagement is one activity that I would like to highlight as a positive spin. I think it's very interesting and very important. There is there's anything else you want to add, Jessica, please? Sure. One thing that I would like to highlight is the World Jewish Congress uh, SECA Forum, the Forum for Special Envoys uh, and Coordinators for Combating Anti-Semitism. Uh, they meet up twice a year and they are representatives from their national governments uh, with a specific mission to combat anti-Semitism. And they are representatives from all over the world, and they meet twice a year to share best practices, to see initiatives being created right there on the spot is amazing. And all these ideas are easily and quickly in an efficient way being disseminated, and we have seen many countries take great strides in implementing new policies and so on. And these envoys that uh, they're also very locally engaged with their country's Jewish community. Uh, they have interactions in person and they know the community. They're not necessarily a part of it or from it, it's uh, government representatives, but 
it creates this kind of bridge between the community and the government and towards other international organizations. Yeah, so actually today uh, with ERRC, um, Roma, which is also a Czech, um, which is a Czech organization, Roma-led organization, um, and with the Forum for Human Rights today, we are publishing actually two reports um, related to the state of hate speech in the Czech Republic, plus a policy guide for um, state representatives um, to know what they should change in their policies in order to get, do better. Um, so along those lines, um, I think for the future, um, we, we really would like to continue working with volunteers and, and broaden there and our perspectives, um, have more organizations and countries involved. I, we really hope that this year in, in Italy and in Hungary we will also have a volunteer group and um, continue basically um, the, the same work we do, uh, putting forward rung, young Roma and non-Roma activists um, and actually uh, continue basically suing uh, public officials, politicians for, for the hate speech that, that they spread across um, Europe. So I think that's quite positive. <laughs> yes, yes, and your work is very effective. So thank you very much and thank you all of you. I would like to give the floor to the audience now. If you have any questions, please raise your hand and uh, then we will try to get you a microphone. Okay, Wuchu. Thank you, my name is Wuchu Nyadi from Political Capital. Um, you mentioned a lot or you talked a lot about coalitions and I wonder whether you could elaborate a bit more on what kind of, do you see room, I know that uh, that's happening, but do you see room for coalitions within or among your groups, among the communities, like, you know, coalition for, um, to fight minority, for fight for minority rights, across the diverse or different groups. And the other question I may have is um, concerning your point, which you mentioned, Remy, which I like very much, is that fighting for minority, minority rights and fighting against hate speech is actually fighting for democracy. And I think it's completely true, especially in the age of, in this post through age and how we can see that politicians exploit anti, um, anti minority sentiments. Um, so, and how do you feel about like fighting for your communities, whether this, uh, I don't know, gives you a, 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 an additional burden that you also fight for democracy. So are you kind of, um, can you, um, how do you uh, um, cope with kind of this challenge and whether you are, whether you feel that you get accepted um, for this by politicians, for instance, or other civil society uh, organizations? Thanks. Who would like to answer? <laughs> um, I mean, on the coalition building, it can be very short, obviously. I mean, yes, I mean, I, I didn't mention it because it, it's kind of obvious, I think, that uh, as minority groups, we should build coalitions. Although the reason why I didn't mention it is also because we should go beyond. Uh, being just minority groups fighting for democracy. We need to widen up, meet with sometimes even sometimes a bit more conservative people and to try them and to understand that fighting for our rights is as important as fighting for uh, for anything else that they are fighting for to just yeah, secure uh, democracy. Fighting for democracy, how to cope with it, uh, <laughs> how to being accepted. Well, first it's, it starts actually with being accepted by your own community. It's not always easy to talk about national about how the defense of national of, of LGBTQ plus rights and national security issues, um, yeah, are can be mentioned in the same line. Um, it's 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 it has something obviously what the, the fact that Russia has so obviously been attacking LGBTQ plus rights while starting a war against the West basically has helps with this. But believe me, if I started to talk about this within my community. Uh, about 10 years ago, I mean, I was called a conspiracy theorist, I was called a, um, uh, I was called a drama queen, uh, <laughs> um, um, and, um, and especially also the, the notion security and involving 
security authorities, which have a history, of course, of attacking our community as well, as something that is that is that is very difficult to convince people of. Um, however, history being history and things changing, mainly also because of the of the of, of the full scale war, full scale war uh, by by Russia against Ukraine, have has helped a lot in our case. Especially if we talk to politicians today, politicians take you much more seriously. I was talking er earlier already by a report published by the European External Action Service specifically on Russian disinformation LGBTIQ plus, which is basically a copy paste of the research I've written five six years ago. But at the same time, it's not me as LGBTIQ plus activist writing it anymore. It's the European Ministry of Foreign Affairs writing it. So uh, since this publication, I have been invited to places that I would, that, that, that would have never invited me before, speaking to NATO ambassadors, speaking at G7 conferences, and so on. So this is this is also the, the mere fact. Finally, people politicians start to accept this. Also gives us as minority groups also the access towards those finally who can actually make a difference and fight back and this information warfare. Somehow answers your question. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah, I, I agree with um, coalition building among uh, minority groups. And a few years ago, we initiated, um, again, Roma Rights Network, but um, it was great to see the to actually human rights organizations or community organizations with different focus than Roma rights, but having a Roma rights or Roma portfolio, but in the same time, for example, uh, having LGBT uh, plus portfolio applied and wanted to be partners. So we have this ongoing um, network and partnership, and we try, for example, to apply for projects together, um, initiate, um, or if something happens, um, to have this um, immediate reaction together, condemning certain um, um, incidents. So that's absolutely something that I think we would like to um, develop further in the future. And related to the fight, uh, fight for, for a democratic society, uh, what immediately came to my mind is the Dönjöspata um, school segregation compensation case in Hungary. Because I don't think that many people thought about that case as a case being uh, or leading the fight against the democratic uh, backsliding in Hungary, but I think it was, because it, it wasn't just, um, it, it, so not just the, 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 the fact of uh, these children being discriminated for 10 years, separated from their peers, um, and it wasn't just them getting a fair compensation for that violation, but also it was about the independence of the Hungarian judiciary, because the prime minister openly uh, called for the the respect for the the sen um, um, sense of um, justice, or I don't even remember. Um, so I think it was uh, this uh, Schmittian sense of justice uh, of the Hungarians, which uh, evidently meant that not not Roma, but Hungarians. And and I think that, uh, and not just me, I, I like everybody thought that this is kind of uh, trying to influence the, the judiciary, the Supreme Court, to have a different decision than the, the Debrecen Appeal Court. And I think that was a great example of how a Roma rights related case can actually stand out and, and fight for something or represent something that is actually beneficial for, for not just that, that certain community or just for that um, few families, but, but for the entire ca country. And um, evidently, uh, the afterlife of the judgment wasn't so um, victorious and, and uh, gracious. Uh, but still, I think that was something um, outstanding. And I, I just would like to mention this because um, it would be great if more people would think about that that case as as something that um, that contributed to to um, the f to the fight for 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 democratic values in in Hungary. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great example uh, for this. Uh, and uh, Jessica, you want to say uh, something, or uh, especially uh, I would add that. Uh, around the circumstances now uh, it could be more sensitive and uh, to 
big coalition between the uh, Muslim community and the Jewish community in Europe. Uh, so if you want to add something to this as well, I would really appreciate it. Okay. Um, uh, well, I echo both of yours, uh, um, your points about the importance of cooperation and coalition. Um, and I think it's important that we stand up for each other. And But even more so, I think it's important to engage and educate uh, the larger society. Because hate speech is everyone's fight. It's not our fight sitting here. It really is something that I see it more as we need to facilitate for the greater public, for the majority society, to realize that this is their fight. Um, and to engage them rather, because we are quite like-minded, I'm very certain. And so we can have these discussions with each other, but we really need to reach further and engage the larger public. Well, from my end, uh, just to say that uh, like a coalition of migrants uh, is quite uh, uh, difficult. Uh, obviously, it's uh, not a monolithic uh, group, and obviously uh, all of our beneficiaries are quite fragmented uh, in this sense. Um, but what I believe in is more like issue-based uh, coalitions, uh, and uh, something that is also missing, uh, unfortunately, from the uh, the landscape. Uh, and again, I, I believe more in uh, issues that come from uh, uh, grassroots and from uh, uh, local uh, uh, communities uh, and they don't necessarily need to be big transnational uh, issues uh, and also from my end obviously we shouldn't forget that not all the migrants that uh, my organization uh, represents are vulnerable uh, uh, migrants so uh, expats uh, hungarians working in london and so we can all say different uh, stories uh, so just to find this uh, edge, to find this uh, focus on uh, the most vulnerable migrants and then organizing them and empowering them, uh, uh, that's I think the important thing. On the democracy thing, again I need to be really cautious representing an organization that has 175 member states. Uh, um, not all of them democracies, obviously, by definition. Uh, so it's not really uh, the fight that we have. Uh, the fight that we have is what's the first sentence of our uh, constitution, that uh, uh, our mandate is that uh, we believe strongly that migration is, is beneficial. Migration is, uh, uh, is a positive process, both for countries of origin, countries of destination, and for the migrants uh, themselves, if these processes are managed well. So this is our fight that we are working on governance uh, systems uh, and generally speaking processes and systems to basically deliver on the promise of uh, migration. And this is our uh, fight and if uh, side effects are those that you raised then uh, from our angle those are uh, very positive uh, side effects. <laughs> is there any other questions from the audience? Hello, my name is Katarin Jury from the Swiss Embassy in Budapest. Um, very in interesting, <laughs> all of this. From my angle, the Hungarian part is the most interesting, so I would have two questions to, uh, to Reni and to Vivian. Uh, um, you mentioned, and we all know, that in the Hungarian government we have a strong and sometimes subtle, sometimes less subtle uh, anti-LMBTQ um, uh, rhetorics. The question is, where do you see the the limits? Do you perceive, or do your communities perceive, for example, the um, the demographic the democrat uh, demographic forum, which was taking place here, or all this pro-family um, activities, the posters? Do you perceive this as offensive or not? Is this already a step towards hate speech or not? And then, um, Vivi, I would have a question towards you. Um, you mentioned that you uh, see hate speech in Hungary mainly th from the far right. Do you have the impression of having a subtle negative communications from the government side as well, or rather not? Do you perceive something more positive even? 
Thank you. I, I, I think I just very quickly answer this question because I think it's like obvious that yes, um, and it's topical. Like when they need it, they use it. Um, and I, I think uh, coming back to this Gyöngyös Pata case, the only luck in this situation was the COVID-19 pandemic because actually that stopped the, the, the national consultation on uh, whether this judgment was just or unjust towards non-Roma, so the majority of the Hungarians, and the legislation uh, not being openly anti-Roma, but the legislation was amended in a way that it's anti-Roma. So for example, victims of um, uh, school segregations cannot uh, um, get any more financial compensation they need to um, or they can accept actually uh, trainings provided by the institutions that segregated them or um, the new um, se uh, po um, new institution of school guards uh, were introduced in 2021 uh, and uh, according to the Rosa Parks Foundation um, data 67 percent of the schools that these um, school guards are actually um, uh, uh, employed are Roma majority schools so it's um, it's about again control uh, depicting Romani children as violent and dangerous um, so I, I think it's it's absolutely out there. Um, sometimes it's lower, sometimes it's higher, but I don't think that this is spe specific to Hungary. I think anti-gypsism is very, very heavily um, embedded in European societies, and uh, um, actually it, grow, it grew together with the, the European history. So it's not something that you can, um, can just... Um, um, I don't even know what is the, the 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 right word for that, but like it coexists with the with the history of of Europe. So, and Hungary is is um, among those countries. Um, do we perceive? Do 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 we as LGBTQ plus community perceive the prophetic family campaigns of the Hungarian government as offensive? Well, I think first of all for the. And we need to speak about the wide LGBTQ plus community and since there has been, I, I don't recall any research on this, which would be very interesting if they would perceive it, but for those and the no, it's very clearly this is offensive. Um, obviously, the family policy that Katalin Novak has set up here in Hungary is a very exclusive, ex exclusive uh, family policy. Uh, rainbow families uh, are very much excluded from it. Uh, you can sh she bans basically adoption for uh, for 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 same-sex parents and and so on. So uh, it's very exclusive the the, the pro-family campaigns. It's not again. It's, it's especially for our families, but also. Look Looking at it from a from a, from an international perspective, we know that that pro-family language is the language that is being put forward by the anti-LGBTQ plus international groups to be used. I and mean, um, the the biggest anti-LGBTQ plus conference, which also was organized in 2017 here in Budapest, is called the World Congress of Families. Um, so this pro-family narrative is something that has been used by anti-LGBTIQ plus groups for many, many years, and it's the same kind of narrative as pro-life uh, while it's being anti-abortion. So this is the kind, of the same kind of narrative, the same kind of group, same kind of same people basically who made up this marketing uh, of, the, the, of this. It's a very good marketing, unfortunately, which seems to work. Um, so it, it's, uh, it is something that 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 we know it's coming from somewhere, and it's coming from these international anti-LGBTQ groups, especially in the World Congress of Families, um, and and the linking this to uh, you've been mentioning the the demographic forum that is being organized here every single year. Uh, we also see next to the pro-family language, we also see that uh, that especially Katalin Novak, and she's really a leader on this on the international level, I do recall her giving speeches at the United Nations General Assembly just last year, where she was uh, warning everybody for a demographic win for the, for a demographic winter, given the demographic circumstances that Hungary is in, that there is a demographic decline, and we see this in the wider West, from Russia all the way to Spain, we see this happening. Um, and it's basically referring, especially the word demographic winter, comes from conspiracy theory. 
It comes from a conspiracy theory that is being imposed in the 80s and the 90s by American evangelicals uh, called the demographic winter theory. Um, and that is basically accusing abortion and uh, queer people, uh, LGBTQ plus people, for being responsible for the demographic de decline. Uh, so we know where it's coming from. And it's very interestingly that now Kathleen Novak, uh, which obviously was already for many years in, 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 in all of these uh, circles moving around, she is now obviously also using the same words as these conspiracy theor theories that have been written down um, by, by American evangelicals back in the 80s and the 90s. Um, so yes <laughs> so also i mean we need to also look not just on the pro-family side but also the way that words as demography today are being misused thank you very much i think demography would be another topic that we could uh, talk about it for an hour with the, the different point of view and the instrumentalization and it would be relevant for all of the vulnerable groups that we uh, represent here uh, as organizations but uh, unfortunately i our time is over now so i would like to thanks a lot uh, for you uh, for having their brilliant thoughts and uh, for this great discussion thank you very much And thank you also for the audience. And uh, I will give the mic to Bocho. Thank you. Thank you for this great discussion, for this great uh, panel.